So picking up on the uh, valuation of Starbucks, <clears throat> uh, which you need to follow along on, basically where we ended up on Monday's class, the last section, is we pretty much created a six-year forecast of Starbucks financial statements, which created six years of economic statements and cash flows. So today what we want to do is continue adding to the model by turning those cash flows into a valuation. So we're going to start by going to the last tab of our models called ROIC drivers. We're going to hit the plus and we're going to add a new worksheet or a new tab. And this tab is going to be called valuation. And I'll make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see what I'm about to do. But we're going to follow the Medigliani Miller process. So the first part of the process is to do an operating value, which is based on free cash flow. And we had already forecasted a free cash flow for Starbucks in the model in our CFI. So we're going to basically use those free cash flow numbers to help us create that operating value forecast. So the first year, and I'm going to start doing this down the rows as opposed to across the columns, just so that if you ever have to print it out, it'll print out in a nice clean sheet of paper. But basically equals relative references. First year of forecast, I'll get out the CFI, was H2, which would have been 2019, equals previous year plus one. And we're going to have five defined years going through 2023 before we enter year six, which is the continuing value or terminal value period. Okay. So for the first five years, we have a forecast for free cash flow from CFI, right? So in 2019, so for B2 equals from our CFI, first forecast year is 2019. So column H, free cash flows row 13, so H13. 2020 free cash flow from the CFI is I13. 2021 free cash flow, so I'll be four here, off the CFI would be J13. 2022 free cash flow off the CFI would be K13. And 2023 free cash flow would be L13. And I'll format that. Does a currency one decimal place. And so those are, again, assuming our model forecast is correct, the next five years of free cash flows for Starbucks. So the next thing I need to do is present value them because I'm interested in having the value today. Okay. So I'm going to do that by multiplying it by the discount factors. So present value is cash flow divided by one, uh, divided by one plus R to the N or T. So I'm going to multiply cash flow times one divided by one uh, plus R to the N or T. Okay. So here's the point. First year discount factor equals one divided by left paren one plus R. And the R is the WAC, which is off the assumptions tab. So B4 assumptions, right paren. 0.914076782. Okay, so if I were to multiply the free cash flow by the discount factor, I would get a discounted free cash flow or basically a present value. So take 2867.6, multiply it by 0.914 and change. We basically get 2621.25. Right, we repeat this process for each of the other years. The difference is when I copy this, I want assumptions B4 to always refer to that cell. So dollar sign B, dollar sign 4. When I copy that down, the next thing is it's 1 divided by 1 plus R to the N. So in the second year, it's 1 divided by 1 plus the WAC squared. In the third year, 1 divided by 1 plus R cubed. In the fourth year, one divided by one plus r to the fourth power. So again, shift six is the power of four. And 2023 to the fifth power, shift six, five. And my free cash flow again is 
free cash flow times discount factor is my discounted free cash flow. Copy that formula down. So basically the present value or the operating value of first five years is the sum of those five numbers or 13 billion 352 million and change right so yes uh, it's just a time or b times c b3 times c3 that's all it is and then next row down uh, b4 times c4 etc and then we're just summing up column d so again in a present value basis Starbucks selling coffee and other stuff is going to generate $13.3 .3 billion worth of free cash flow operating value in the next five years, assuming our forecast comes true. Okay. Now, year six is the beginning of the continuing value or terminal value period. We're assuming that Starbucks is going to continue, so we do it with companies, and so we're going to have to create a long-term value for Starbucks. Now, year six was arbitrary. We could have started in year seven, year 12, year 20, you know, we could have forecast as many years as we wanted, all right? I'm just, for simplicity, doing five years. I'm not saying it's a best practice. It's just an easy practice, all right? But whatever you forecast, you will forecast one extra period, a T plus one or an N plus one period, all right? That is the year six, 2024. That period is the beginning of our continuing value. So the next estimate is what is the continuing value of Starbucks? Ten. Okay. And in order to do that, we're going to use a variation of the growing perpetuity called here's my preview. Key value driver equation. So the key value driver equation, one of the reasons why I've been using it this semester, is that is a growing perpetuity. All right, it's got four factors in it, no plat, G, ROIC, and WAC. All right, if we know those four things for the long term, we can value the company today. So this is gonna be the most difficult part of the model. You're gonna have to put that formula into this cell, <clears throat> okay? But rather than just putting it all scattered across the model, because we might actually change some of these assumptions in the future, I'm going to build it off of the assumptions tab. So one of the four items is the WAC. The other three that we will need is the continuing value no plat. We will need a continuing value ROIC. And we'll need a continuing value G. And those will all be yellow. All right, for our continuing value no plat, equals from our TII, 2024 is the beginning of our continuing value period. No plat is row five, so M5. Format that to one decimal place. For our continuing value ROIC equals from the EPEOY tab, 2024, ROIC is row 16, so M16 is our ROIC focus for forecast for 2024, 42.3%. And our G is just going to be 3%. I'm going to put this as a placeholder right now. Later, we'll talk about how to make it a more reflective G, but the idea is... This is the growth of the cash flow proxy margin, uh, or sorry, proxy revenue growth at the same margin of a company over a long period of time into perpetuity. So the, the working assumption is if you're mature, you're probably going to grow about the economy's GDP. So for Western companies, 2 to 3%, I'm putting a 3% placeholder in here. Later, we will adjust it, but I just wanted to have a number to get us started. So 3% arbitrary. Continuing value, no plat, continuing value, ROIC, is based on the 2024 forecast. Now, the reason why I'm putting these here in yellow 
is because that 2024 forecast is supposed to be representative of the continuing value period. If it is not, we need to change these numbers to be more representative. So for example, let's say Starbucks were a cyclical business and 2024 was the bottom of a cycle. Well, I don't want to use that in my perpetuity because it will probably undervalue Starbucks. So again, we're using 2024, but we have the ability to overwrite any of these at a, at a time, which is why I'm making them in yellow, okay? But given these four assumptions, let's price Starbucks. So let's go back to the valuation. So now with those assumptions, I'm ready to put this formula in. So equals left paren, working off the assumptions tab. My no plat, so B5 times left paren, one minus my CV uh, G, which is B7, divided by the CV ROIC, which is B6, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, my WAC, which is B4, minus my G, which is B7. Right paren. So 79.87 billion and change. And again, I'll leave that up here for a second. So basically, assuming those continuing value assumptions or terminal value assumptions come true, which is B5 times 1 minus B7 divided by B6, divided by B4 minus B7, then basically what we're saying is Starbucks will generate $13.35 billion of free cash flow value in the first five years, and then another $79 billion thereafter okay, of operating value. But the problem is, that's not a present value. 79.87 is not in today's dollars. So I had to put it in today's dollars. Now, built into the assumption of a continuing value perpetuity, it actually does have a discount factor in it, and it basically present valued that to the beginning of 2024. So that's the January 1, 2024 value, which coincidentally is pretty much equal to the December 31st, 2023 value. So I have to take that back to today, let's take B9 multiplied by C9 to get 5967.98 of value today of the continuing value pair. Now don't make the double discounting error because this already is a discounted factor, you don't have to discount this year again. That's why we're using the same discount factor as 2023. Because 2024 was already discounted as part of that number. Right? But the key point here is that the operating value of Starbucks for the first five years, 13.35, plus the perpetuity period, 50.967, is 64320089 That is the operating value of Starbucks selling its products and services, 64320089 Now, continuing with Digliani Miller, Operating one plus non-operating two equals enterprise value. So our next step is to value the non-operating cash flows. Okay, this is where TFI helps us. For row column thirteen, or row thirteen equals off the TFI. We've listed the non-operating assets that we have to value: excess cash, non-operating assets, less non-operating liabilities, and long-term investments. So starting with a ten through A12, I'm gonna put them on this sheet, right? Now, here's the deal. The assumption we're gonna make, and there is an assumption being made here, financially, okay? And again, if you decide you wanna do something differently, you always have that option. But the assumption that we're making here is that I invest in Starbucks because of what I believe they do as an operating entity. Starbucks isn't being invested in for non-operating purposes, okay? So I invest in Starbucks because they know how to make coffee. I don't invest in Starbucks because they manage a REIT in China. Okay, so that's not really a core competency probably of their business. So I'm not saying their non-operating assets might have value, but at the end of the day, it's not what they do. So the general assumption for non-operating investments is in the future, there'll be NPV zero, right? You're not really skilled at things you don't do very often, so we're just going to assume that investments in that in the future stay NPV zero. If for some reason you believe they're different, you can always evaluate them differently, but that's kind of an assumption most people make, and that's one we'll make in this class. Now, but the thing we do have is we do have the values today 
So they will be NPV zero in the future, but they have some non-operating asset value today. And those are those three items. So today is 2018. So column G is the historical results. So what I'm going to do here in the valuation tab is for excess cash, I'm going to take the current value. So let's go back to TFI. G is 2018. 10, which is excess cash, 84.43. And then again, I can copy and paste down the next two. Negative 73, 24.6 of non-operating assets, less non-operating liabilities, and long-term investments at 267.7, which again, I'm going to format as currency one decimal place. Now, just very quickly, cash is cash. So I, I think that's a realistic value of the cash. Non-operating assets and non-operating liabilities. I'm assuming that the accountants and the uh, in the firm and outside of the firm are doing a reasonable job of putting things on book value. And the book value is probably not that far from the market value. But the one tricky part could be long-term investments. If I made a long-term investment in another business, the market value of that could be far different than the value of my balance sheet. Because for non-financial firms, FASB does not allow mark-to-market -market accounting. Okay, so basically what it means is, let's say I'm, you know, a music company and I made an early investment into Spotify. Well, now that Spotify is public and much more valuable, I still have to have the value of Spotify on my books as what I spent originally. I don't have the value on my books of Spotify's market cap. Now, if I were a financial institution, I could market to market, but for a non-financial institution, they can't market to market. So that's the one challenge with valuation. In fact, years ago in this class, we were valuing Yahoo, and Yahoo owned 30% of Alibaba. So the real value, of Ali, real value of Yahoo is Yahoo is worthless, but they were pretty much a tracking stock for Alibaba because they own 30% of Alibaba, which they bought a long time ago before Alibaba went public as one of the biggest IPOs in the history of the world. And so it, they won the lottery. But on their books, you didn't see that on their balance sheet. You just saw it reflected in their market price. Okay? So the point of the story here is that we need an adjustment mechanism if this book value is far different than the market value. So here's how we're going to do it. In the assumptions tab, our next line down is going to be called the price to book multiple of long-term investments. And we're going to make that one. A couple decimal places here. And we're going to make this yellow. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this valuation. We're going to take the long-term investments. And we're going to multiply that by the price to book multiple. Now, when we multiply it by one, nothing's going to change. But let's just say that Starbucks invested in a company and today it's worth six times more than what they paid, put in price to book of six, model adjust the valuation to 1606.2. Okay, So that's the reason why we're putting it in there. So if we know the value, we can use the multiple to essentially adjust to a market price. If we have no idea what the value is, at a minimum, we can leave the price to book multiple of one. And we at least are accounting for the book value. All right? But nonetheless, when we go back to our valuation tab and we sum these three things up, we get the non-operating value, which these are already in a present value. So we just sum them up. And for Starbucks, that would be an additional 1386.5. Now, the next step is to take the two together, the operating and non-operating value, and to get what we call an enterprise value. Okay, one plus two equals enterprise value. So our enterprise value is the operating value, 6430320.89, so D11, plus the non-operating value, D17, 65707.4. It is this enterprise value that is then to be distributed amongst the financial stakeholders. 
all the threes, the debt, and eventually the equity holders, including first the non-common th fours, non-common equity holders, and then common get what's left after everybody else has been paid. Okay. So again, this is where TFI helps us because we've identified those financial stakeholders on TFI. So starting in row 21, I have to pay off retirement related liabilities, so A15. I have to pay off, off TFI the interest bearing debt, A16. I have to pay off, not the common, because I'm solving to the common, but the preferred shareholders, A18, and the minority shareholders, a19. Those are the four stakeholders that are going to be paid. Then what residuals left, because they have priority, goes to the common shareholders. Okay. And the amount that I owe them is what I owe them now. So for retirement related liabilities equals, so for D21, off of TFI, the 2018 reported retirement liabilities, which are row 15, G15. Interest bearing debt off of TFI is 16, so G16. Preferred shareholders off of TFI would be row 18, so G18. And minority shareholders have to be paid off off the TFI. Column G is 2018, minority is G19. Yes. So, for interest bearing debt, this would be 9,440. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I had the wrong. Be careful about that. Thank you for pointing that out. So, this should be G. Thank you. I clicked on the wrong cell. Thank you for pointing that out. So, again, it's retirement related liabilities, interest bearing debt. Make sure you get your references right because it's easy to click on the wrong cell. Uh, preferred shareholders, which is G18, and minority interest is G19. So here's the point. Our common, common equity value equals the enterprise value minus the sum of those four items. So fifty six billion two hundred sixty one million. I thought might be just all one decimal place. All right. If I divide that by the shares outstanding, then I would get a forecast share price. So here's where we're going to tie this back to Bloomberg. So in Bloomberg, if you go to the DES screen, security description for, in this case, Starbucks, not going, Starbucks, and then security description, DES, it's kind of like the cliff notes for what's going on with the company. Over here on the left hand side, current shares outstanding. So nice feature of Bloomberg right here. They're aggregating based on the latest filing. The share is outstanding for the company. So it's just an easy way to find it. So right now, 1.243.6 billion shares. So 1243.6 is the share count. Now, I don't want to put it here because inevitably I'll forget that I put it there in terms of the share count. I have a weird share price for some other company. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to off the assumptions tab. Next assumption down. Shares outstanding. It's going to be a yellow cell, something I can change. And it's going to be that number 1243.6. Now, one thing that I've done to help you roadmap is up here across the top, I've taken screenshots, take screenshot, save. And the screenshots, you can see this here on Elms, are named, and I put this in the Starbucks folder, sbucks-des. 
Okay. So ticker symbol dash Bloomberg short code. So when you have to replicate this for another company, it's your cookbook. Okay. You know how to, you know where to go, you know where to get the data from. Matter of fact, these are the next screens that we're going to need EEO and WAC. Okay. So I've put all those files that, that I'm about to screenshot in Bloomberg from a previous class into this folder. Right. However, the one thing I am going to do is because Starbucks stock price has been bouncing around today, just so that we're all looking at the same stock price, I'm going to use that original screenshot, the DES one, pop it right here, to see that at the time I did the screenshot this morning, their share price was 70.80. So for purposes of our valuation, we're going to use $70.80 a little bit later to value stock price for Starbucks, just so we're consistently looking at a price. Okay, but nonetheless, it hasn't changed that much today. So, but here's the point. You get the share count here, all right? Now, let's continue. So back to our model. I then go back to the valuation. Shares outstanding on that tab equals from the assumptions tab. B9. Share price equals D26 divided by D28. 45.24 a share. So just on baseline assumptions, based on the data in our model today, we're projecting a share price of 45.24. Okay. At this point, the foundation of our valuation model is pretty much done. Okay. We're, we're going to make some nuances and changes, but a lot of the basic plumbing has been now put in place. And this is a real model. Like this works in the real world. Okay. So with that in mind, here's what we're going to do next. We're going to go back here, and we're now going to go under the Assumptions tab, and we're going to create the concept of an as-is valuation. So the current share price of Starbucks, I believe we said was 70.80 at the time of the valuation. Okay, that was the back to this screen. Right there. So seventy dollars and eighty cents. I'm going to make that yellow because I could change it based on the company I'm doing. And then my model share price equals valuation forty five twenty four D thirty. So when we do what I call an as-is valuation, and not everybody does this, right? but I'm going to recommend, well, I'm going to require you do this as part of this semester, this class, but recommend you continue to do this, is the first step before we put in our opinion for what Starbucks stock price should be, that's the target price, I want us to understand why the stock price is trading at what it is today. So basically, I want the model to match the current. So an as-is is matching, okay? So here's the deal. Starbucks is trading at $70.80. I need to know why. So cash flow of the company should DCF to that. We have a cash flow model. Let's back into what cash flows do that. So let's try and understand what assumptions the market is using to price Starbucks at $70.80 a share. It doesn't matter whether I agree with that price or not. That price is actually in the real world today. So the point of the as-is is everyone in this room is prejudiced, including me. We have our biases about these companies. And our biases are going to seep into our valuations. They just are. Can't help it. All right, You might hate the company. It's going to give you a more negative view of the company. You might love Starbucks and be addicted to caffeine. It's going to give you a more positive view of the company. So the point of the story is we got to take a little bit of that out. So what I want us to do in the as is, is I want to look at the price and we'll say, okay, mechanically, what cash flows get there? So work backwards. That's the as is. Then you can do a second model where you can put in your own opinion. Right? But regardless of whether you agree with the price, I need to understand what cash flows get to the price. Okay? That's the part of an as is valuation. So got to get these two. And I'm going to use within a dollar is the standard for an as is this semester. Okay? So you don't have to be exactly 70.80. If you're 70.59, I'm going to say that's pretty darn close, okay? But if you're 70.80 is the stock price and you're at 45, well, you didn't do your job.
Okay, so you got to be again within a dollar of the current share price. So how do we do this? Well, first thing is we needed a whack, and we had a placeholder whack from before, which I don't think 9.4% is realistic for Starbucks. So let's see what their whack is today. Second screenshot in Bloomberg. Go to the company. Type in WACC and get their WAC. And right here is the WAC of Starbucks today, 7.8%. I had taken a screenshot for this. I uploaded it in the Starbucks folder. That's Starbucks WAC today, 7.8%. So in our model for cell four assumptions, 7.8. By the way, our share prices are a lot closer. So we just did. Okay. So as we think about Starbucks, we got the right whack, got the right share count. We know the price. We know we're trying to match. Now we go over to the ratios. And the real value of Starbucks that matters, and actually before I go to ratios, it shows you the valuation. What matters is getting not the non-operating value right, but the operating value right. And the operating value is based on free cash flow. So what really matters is this forecast for free cash flow. So let's go back to ratios. I briefly alluded to this, but there's three gray highlighted rows. These gray highlighted rows are the most important forecasts that drive your free cash flow calculation. This is the 90-10 of the valuation. 90% of your time should be spent on those three numbers. That's 90% of your valuation, okay? Because that's that those 10% represent 90% of your value, All right? Because again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to forecast free cash flow. Free cash flow is gross cash flow, which is basically no plat. Well, guess what? If I forecast revenue growth rate, EBITDA margin, and tax rate, I'm basically forecasting a no plat. I'm forecasting a gross cash flow. That's why those numbers are so important, because those are the cash flow forecast numbers, All right? The other side of it is I have to forecast a gross investment, which means I also have to forecast the balance sheet. Here is where the simplified assumptions I made on the last class help us. I told you that every one of these balance sheet ratios is a percentage of sales. And I said I did it for two reasons. The reason I told you on Monday is I said for simplicity, it was just easier. I said there's another reason which I'll come back to. Well, now I'm coming back to it. Every one of those balance sheet ratios is a percentage of sales, which means if my sales grow, since the balance sheet's a percentage of sales, the balance sheet grows with sales, and the model will forecast automatically a growing balance sheet. The change between two balance sheets is called gross investment. So the advantage of doing it this way is that the model will auto-calculate gross investment for you based on revenue growth, okay? Now, embedded in that is a very important assumption that the productivity of a firm is not changing, which means the level of investment to drive sales stays about the same. If the productivity is gonna be far different in the future, then you have to forecast the balance sheet items individually. But if the productivity stays about the same, the model will auto forecast your balance sheet for you and you're okay. Okay. So again, if I think about Starbucks, how much they have to spend on stores and coffee and cups and labor, I don't think that's going to change all that much in the future. So I'm going to assume the productivity staying the same for our simplistic valuation model here today. So I'm going to leave the balance sheet alone so that we can fo focus on these three remaining items to get our valuation to go. Okay. So the next item is tax rate. I need a realistic tax rate for Starbucks. Now I'm gonna unhide the historical data, which I hid in the last class, mainly because I, I wanted to, to be, see what's going on, on the screen, but I wanna make another point. I need a representative tax rate for Starbucks going forward. The worst thing that I could do is take the last six years and average them, All right? Main reason is, think about what happened last year. Last year, the corporate tax rate changed in the US from 35 to 21. So if I take the last six years and average them, I'm not going to reflect that. And I'm going to get a weird tax rate going forward. So this is why benchmarking historical analysis is a problem with valuation. 
Like if the past repeats itself, that's okay. But if the past doesn't repeat itself, then the past could cause you a lot of problems. That's why you're going to have to use your judgment calls here. But the point is, averaging the last six years is not going to give me a realistic tax rate for Starbucks. So I need a realistic tax rate for Starbucks. By the way, Starbucks is a real world company and the analysts that are covering Starbucks are trying to answer the exact same questions that we are because they have an Excel model that looks a lot like our models and they're trying to do the same thing. And so basically what I'm talking about is these people. If I go to Starbucks and I go to ANR, these are the 33 sell side analysts today that are covering Starbucks. And these analysts, including Nicole Miller Reagan of Piper Joffrey, who on 313, which happens to be today, uploaded her Excel file to Bloomberg. So she created an Excel file just like us. She uploaded it this morning to Bloomberg. But you'll notice it says unauthorized because our educational license doesn't give us access to that unless we pay a whole lot more money. Now, you can also click on it, request it, and I did, and I was immediately denied. So I tried. Okay. But Piper Joffrey doesn't care about me as some lowly University of Maryland professor unless I give them a bunch of money. So that's the point. If you're their client, they'll give you the spreadsheet. If you're the company, they'll give you the spreadsheet. If you're some random schmo, they're probably not going to give you the spreadsheet. Okay, But here's the point. All 33 people have been giving Bloomberg their spreadsheets. Bloomberg has been averaging and aggregating it, and they publish it under EEO. This is what the analyst's average guesses represent. And it's going to be very important. The other thing that's happening, and this is the other screen, EVT, is the event calendar. On the event calendar, these are the corporate events. Conference calls, conferences, both past and upcoming. So, for example, Starbucks next quarterly earning call is going to be on April 25th. This is where the analyst will get the, the pin and the dial-in number. Okay, the last quarterly conference call was on January 24th. One of the things Bloomberg does is they listen to every company's conference call. As soon as the call's over, there's an audio transcript. You can listen to the replay of the call. Or there is a text transcript because they're listening in with voice processing and machine learning and literally in real time transcribing the call. Within minutes of the end of a conference call, you can go to Bloomberg and get a transcript of the call. Very nice feature of Bloomberg. That's a transcript of the first quarter call. Every one of these analysts needs to know Starbucks tax rate. Whether they're going to ask the question or the company knowing they need that number is going to give them guidance, tax rates are going to be talked about in these calls. So here's a nice thing. You can search a PDF. Tax rate. So this is Patrick Grismer. Patrick Grismer is. Oh, I'm trying to get here. S Bucks Management. Grismer is where's Grismer? Eleven. He's just a CFO. So if he's he's talking about the tax rate. He probably knows what he's talking about, okay? So in the conference call, what Grismer is telling the analysts, let's go back here. He basically says, thank you. Uh, so here's what he said. Additionally, for fiscal 2019, we now expect our gap effective tax rate to be in the range of 21 to 23% and our non-gap effective tax rate to be in the range of 20 to 22. So last year, 21.8, I think we can leave that alone. You will make it 22, you make it 21.5, I'm not going to argue too much, but I, I think that's the point. We now have a reasonable tax rate. So that's one method that you're going to use this semester to get the tax rate, is get it from the company. Or listen to the Q&A, Q&A, the analysts need this too. So you're going to see these for publicly traded companies. Option B is get an analyst report. In Bloomberg, it's BRC. That's Bloomberg Research. And that's where they aggregate all of the analyst stuff. There's BRC. Unfortunately, our license at Maryland does not give us access to very many analyst reports. 
Okay, but the one that they seem to do is J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan's a respectable firm. So what you can do is look up the J.P. Morgan analyst report for Starbucks. I don't know who Trefus is, so I don't trust that. My apologies to Trefus, but anyways, but look up J.P. Morgan, and in that analyst report, which is 32 pages long, there's probably a, a, a tax rate forecast because that's the point. The analyst needed to do that to forecast their value. They're putting it in their research. So you're going to get the tax rate one or two places from the company transcript, which is more ideal, or from the guidance from any one of the Q or K calls or number two or an investor day presentation, or you're going to get it from research. But that's the point. You need a realistic tax rate. And so again, as we march on, our final two numbers off the income statement are EBITDA and revenue growth rate. And this goes back to the analysts. I don't think that any one of us in this room, myself included, knows Starbucks better than the sell side analysts who are covering Starbucks for a living. So this is the consensus estimate today based on the analysts. And this is the wisdom of the crowd. So since we're trying to do an as is, I want to use the wisdom of the crowd to justify the as is because this is the baseline that Wall Street's using. So let's use Wall Street's baseline as part of our as is. Now, I want you to understand exactly how this consensus is created. So for 2019 revenue forecast, so that's right here, $26 billion is the revenue consensus today. Of the 33 analysts today, 28 have uploaded a spreadsheet with a sales guess for 2019. Right? They've sent that sales guess to Bloomberg. They were averaged. Three of them were taken out as mathematical outliers, and the remaining 25 were within a range of 26.017 on the low end and 26.772 on the high end. 25 guesses were within that range. Okay, The average of all those guesses was the consensus, which is 26.282. So that's exactly how the consensus estimate is created is that the analysts upload their guesses, the guesses are aggregated, and then basically the average guess is the market. Again, wisdom of the crowd. But here's the benefit. To us, plus or minus that amount is pretty much what the pros are guessing for Starbucks. So when we do our as is, we can use these numbers. Now, here's the thing. There are 25 analysts that are used in the guesses for revenue for 2019. There are 26 analysts that are used for the guesses in 2020. There are eight analysts for 2021, and there's one brave soul for 2022, right? Now, every one of those analysts has a spreadsheet with a 2022 number. You have to. You, otherwise, you couldn't do evaluation, right? But here's the thing. They're not making it public. They don't want their individual guesses for 20 to 22 public because you're tracked, and I don't want to look crazy in three years when I said 33 billion, the number's 40 billion. Like, I'm a bad analyst. So as you go out to the further years, you'll notice publicly that you won't see the guesses. And it's not that they're not guessing, they just don't make them public. So their clients will get the guesses, right? And the clients can see that, but Bloomberg's not going to have it flagged to, to make public because the analysts don't want it to be, except for this one brave soul. Okay, so so I'm just saying is you're going to see how many people are guessing. Now, how does that apply to us? Well, it applies to us because for Starbucks, I want to use probably the first three years in my model as I try and do revenue and EBITDA. I may not use the fourth year because I don't know if this one person is good or just brave. Right. So I just don't know. So I'm not going to use that as the, the sole number, but I could because they might know more than me. I just don't know, but at least the first three. So here's how we're going to do this. In our assumptions tab, the first forecast year equals 2018 plus one equals plus one equals plus one. This is the consensus revenue estimate. This is the consensus 
EBITDA estimate for each of those years, 19, 20, and 21. So again, I'm going to work off of the EEO screen it's right here. I put it as a screenshot so you can see it, or more importantly here. So for 2019, 26282. For 2020, 28306. And for 2021, 3570. For EBITDA, for 2019, today, the Wall Street analysts are expecting 56.43. For 2020, they're expecting 62.27. And for 2021, they're expecting 68.23. I am going to make these yellow and dollars to one decimal place. So that my EBIT da margin forecast is my EBIT da for 2019 divided by my revenue for EBIT for 2019 or essentially 21.5%. Copy, paste. So by 2021, analysts today are expecting Starbucks margin to go to 22.3 from 21.5. That's the consensus estimate today, based on the numbers that are in Bloomberg. So I go back to my ratios. That is these three years. So I'm going to unyellow or no fill them. And instead of typing them in for H7 off of ratios equals assumptions B17, which is the consensus EBITDA margin. For 2020, the consensus I7 equals from the assumptions tab C17 and 2021 equals from the assumptions D17. Now, I could have copied and pasted over, but I wanted you to specifically see where these three numbers are coming from. By the way, share price, I'm getting close. Now, we're not done, but getting close. Okay? So, <clears throat> Here's the point. I don't like jumping tabs. I get lazy. So as I change things, we're going to change a lot of things. I want to see the impact of share price. So the other thing I'm going to do on my ratios is starting over here in column, I'll do an F, F25 equals assumptions A11, copy, paste, so basically I have here my forecasted share price and the current share price side by side. So that way I change it here, I can immediately see it here. It's make my life easier. Okay, it's just a relative reference because like I said, as you start building this model, it's a very complex model, you don't want to jump around. All right, it just gets annoying with the clicking tab. Or worse, at the beginning of this class, click on the wrong cell by mistake. So it's just easier to kind of bring in these little reference tools along the way. Okay. All right. So here's the reason I said we're not done because unfortunately, even though we got the margin right, what we didn't do is we probably don't have the revenue because we just had arbitrarily said they're growing 10% a year. The analysts may or may not agree with that, but we do know what the analysts are actually saying because we do have their revenues. Okay. So here's our final step ratios. 
take these three years on yellow or no fill them and put in the analyst revenue growth rates. Now the formula for revenue growth rate percentage change is current year minus previous year divided by previous year. That's just algebra. Okay. So for 2019, to get the revenue growth rate for 2019 equals left paren, the 2019 revenue, which I'll get off my assumptions, B15, minus the 2018 revenue, which I'll get off the income tab, G3, right paren, divided by last year's revenue, income G3, 6.3%. So the analysts are basically expecting a 6.3% change in revenue next year. Then for I3 equals left parent 2020 revenue, which is C15, minus 2019 revenue, which is B15, divided by 2019 revenue, which is B15, 7.7%. And for 2021 equals 21 minus 20 divided by 20. Let's see what I did there wrong. Equals left paren 21 minus 20 right paren divided by 20 is 8%. So those are the revenue growth rates. So again, in assumptions B15, it's right here, minus income B3, divided by income B3 was the first year, and then the second year, et cetera, third year. By the way, that gets me a share price, $60. I still got to make up the $10. Everybody follow along so far? Got all the same numbers? Questions about what I did? Okay. So I could then do one of two things. I could then come here to the ratios and I got three out years of revenue growth or margin that I could adjust. Okay. But for simplicity today, let's just say that those are representative. My final number in my valuation off my assumptions is my continuing value G. When we started the class, I said, just leave 3% in there. This is the growth forever of Starbucks, right? So think about this. In our model, we are going from 8% in 2023 and 24 to 3% starting in 2024 forever. Well, we're basically going from a company that's still growing to a company that's mature just like that. And the realistic expectation is probably not going to happen like they're going to fall off a cliff. It's going to be a slow decline. So what it's another way of saying is the CVG is probably got to be higher than 3%. If maturity is 3 and they're growing at 8, the G is going to be somewhere between 3 and 8. Now this is compounding, so it's probably going to be closer to 3, but the point is I will give you later in the semester some tools for estimating a G, but right now I'm just going to riff. So what if it's 4%? 72.78 stock price. What if it's 3.9%? 71.21, I'm within 41 cents of the share price. I'm good. Save, done. This is your homework assignment. Get here, upload, you're finished. Otherwise, you need to get here by the deadline. Okay. But here's the point. While you're, you're kind of considering this, this is why we did the as is, okay? Here's what I know if I'm an analyst today walking into a, a meeting with Starbucks or a conference call. I know that the market is expecting high single digit growth for Starbucks and an increase in their margin of about one to one and a half percent over the next several years, one at 150 basis points. So I'm listening in this meeting to hear what's their growth story. All right, because if I don't hear something that gives me 8% growth, then I'm going to be concerned about this valuation. I'm listening for improvements in margin. Are they saying anything on the conference call 
about better pricing or cost reduction. If I don't hear this, then why am I giving them credit for this improved margin over time? So what I'm telling you is that by doing the as is, it actually sets you up to go talk to the company because you kind of know some of the things the market's expecting from you. And then it's a question of, is that what's actually going to happen? And then I can put my opinion in there and say, you know what? I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think something else could be different. Put in some numbers and that creates the concept of a buy, sell, hold. So the buy, sell, hold comes in when you put your opinion into the model based on what you see, but at least you have a baseline to understand where the company is today on an intrinsic cash flow value. And that's the purpose of the as is that we just did. So this semester, I'm gonna make you always do an as is, okay? And then you'll do that before you do your target. We're also gonna do something called a bull and a bear, but that's for a later class, All right? So questions about any of this we've done here today? All right, great. So make sure you save and upload your file.